Hello, and welcome to part one of the new tutor training videos for the English Language and Literacy Program at LearningWorks. In part one, we'll focus on understanding the lives of adult English language learners. In this lesson, you'll learn about the lives of new Mainers as they resettle, both in the state of Maine and in general in a new American culture. You'll learn about the differences between refugees, asylum seekers, and immigrants. You'll strengthen your understanding of American culture, especially as it relates to other cultural contexts, and you'll be able to consider alternative perspectives in tricky intercultural situations. In this lesson, you'll learn about the lives of new Mainers as they resettle, both in the state of Maine Adult English language learners are sometimes called just that, ELLs. They are sometimes called New Mainers or New Americans. No matter what title they go by, they lead busy lives. As newcomers, they are also husbands and fathers, mothers and wives, students, business owners, employees in a variety of fields, community leaders, as of recently, more increasingly, elected officials, and some of our newest citizens. When they're not busy with work or family, you can often find our students navigating the resources they need at various community organizations or service providers. DHHS offers help with food, Medicaid, and other things that families need as they transition to their lives in the US. FedCap is a program that offers work or work training to new arrivals. Portland Adult Education is an important hub for new Mainers, offering English language instruction for roughly 2,000 new Mainers each year. In fact, many of our students in the English Language and Literacy Program are also enrolled in the academic program at PAE. The lives of English language learners, while busy in the same ways as any adult, can be made more complicated or stable by virtue of their legal status. As mentioned, our students are immigrants, refugees, or asylum seekers. But what do these terms mean? Can you tell which of these people is a refugee, asylum seeker, or immigrant just by looking at them? It's difficult to tell. This information is not readily apparent nor is it something that you as a tutor or teacher may be privy to. However, knowing about what these categories mean and how they might affect the lives or learning of our students is still important. Take a moment to review the particular definitions and qualifications of immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Keep in mind that there are some basic differences to understand. An immigrant is a catch-all term that may be applied to anyone who is moving to the U.S. from another country. However, anyone who identifies only as an immigrant and not a refugee or an asylum seeker is here because they are doing so of their own volition for a reason such as marriage, joining family, or seeking employment. However, Refugees and asylum seekers are given these titles based upon the process that they go through in which they are fleeing their home country. A refugee flees their home country to find safety in a refugee camp and waits for approval from a receiving country. Asylum seekers, on the other hand, while they are still fleeing their home country to find safety, much like a refugee, they are going through this process of their own accord. They are sidestepping the stage of waiting for approval in a refugee camp. An asylum seeker can go directly into a receiving country. However, as listed here, what people are eligible for and able to access upon arriving to the U.S. depends on this difference, refugee or asylum seeker. For context, here are a couple lists of the most commonly seen countries that are the origin of refugees and asylum seekers in Portland. We should note that most of the students in the English Language and Literacy Program are asylum seekers. Many of these asylum seekers face ambiguity regarding their future. 
These people whose cases have not yet been concluded despite a long waiting period of five years or more often don't know if they will be able to stay in this country or will be deported. Oftentimes, if people do receive asylum and are given a green card, they will send for family members to join them. At that point, they are eligible for the same rights as a refugee and can send for family members who may be facing the same unsafe conditions in their home country. Also to be noted is the fact that some students win what is known as the visa lottery, and they can come to this country with a green card and social security card right away. It's important to understand that asking a lot of questions, or in fact any questions, about your student's specific legal status can be sensitive. Everyone has a different comfort level when sharing details about their past, especially those that involve trauma, war, or family separation. It's good to have a broad understanding of these concepts. It affects students' lives and how they learn, process, build relationships, and navigate the day-to-day -day here in the U.S. However, it's best not to dig or delve into these issues with individuals beyond what they may wish to share right away. When working together with a diverse group of people, such as the students in our English Language and Literacy program, it's important to ask the question of, what do we mean when we say culture? More importantly, how does culture and the cultures of people from different countries affect learning or the relationships we build with others who are not from a shared culture? This often forms a crux of the tutor-student relationship. How would you define culture? Is it the clothes we wear and the foods we eat? Or something more, something underlying what we see in terms of people from various countries around the world? Take a look at this definition offered by Professor Wade W. Nobles from San Francisco State University. It will introduce and anchor some of our discussions of culture in the next slides. Before we can conduct an examination on cultural differences, it's important for us to examine our own culture where we're coming from. What are the commonly shared traits and values that we collectively recognize as being distinctively American? Take a look at these two lists. The first on the left, on the left a list of common American traits assembled by an entity called the Cultural Exchange Network. And the list on the right, a list of common American cultural values by Gary Weaver. Which of these values, either the traits or the values on the right, do you recognize, agree with, or maybe disagree with? What have you seen in your own families or workplaces that you would say are indeed examples of American traits and values? Read these lists and then for more information, click on the link on the right from the article by Gary Weaver. The next few slides in this presentation will introduce and explore a topic known as high context or low context communication. Some of the terms in this presentation might sound a bit vague or broad and try to encompass um, large cultural behavioral patterns instead of focusing on individual exceptions. We hope that rather than try to paint in too broad of strokes when discussing cultural communication styles around the world, we instead offer an opportunity to expand our understanding and explore the topic theoretically. Then we'll also offer some ways to think about how different cultural communication styles might manifest in the learning or tutoring spaces that you'll be working in. Let's begin our examination of culture by using a theory developed by Edward T. Hall on high and low context cultures and their effects on communication. Low context communication is typically associated with the area of the world we know as the West, the United States, England, Germany, and other parts of Europe. Communicating is blunt and task-centered. The duration of communication is thought to be best if short and knowledge is made public. There are no people who are kept away from information by virtue of status. In high context cultures, we typically think about these as being from the East, 
However, we're not just talking about East versus West. High context and low context cultures are found everywhere, within families, within the workplace, within your field of work. It depends on the people who share that space with you and the values that guide their communication with each other. But for the purposes of a broad comparison and contrast of these traits, theoretically, we can juxtapose them for a clearer understanding. So in high context culture or Eastern style, the message is implicit and indirect. People expect you to understand more than what is said. Deciphering the message is expected of the listener and is their responsibility. There is a hierarchy at work within high context communication. People who are in those contexts must defer often to whoever is at the top of the hierarchy. They are not necessarily explicit. If you aren't practiced in doing it, you may experience a great deal of frustration. Or you may, if you're from another country, feel like American communication is too blunt and could lead to being offended. This diagram, although not comprehensive or perfectly representational, is a helpful way to start conceptualizing this idea of a continuum of low context to high context cultures. Examples of specific countries as well as broader regions of the world or continents are given here. So a few specific countries that exhibit low context communication styles include Germany and the United States, whereas higher context countries include Brazil, Ghana, and Japan, amongst other regions of the world. Here's another way to conceptualize the idea of low context and high context communication styles. In a low context culture, such as the one on the left with the blue, the communication style is direct. We as speakers in a low context culture may go right over the black dot. We will go right through the subject and address what is at the center of the idea. On the red side, the high context side, you may skirt or talk around the issue to give the impression of what you're talking about without naming it explicitly because to do so would violate cultural mores and possibly offend others. Here is yet another way to think about low context communication, here represented on the left side of the comic, and high context communication, here on the right. One theme that often comes up in discussions of cultural differences using this framework is that of time. In low context cultures, such as the United States, time is very much a way in which we structure our day and compartmentalize our activities. Our relationship with time is often described as monochronic. It is precise and the expectations of punctuality are built into the culture. One of our most common challenges our tutors have with students is that of timeliness. It is consistently a complaint we hear, but the fact that our relationship with time is cultural is important here. Our students are on a learning curve in this respect. They are learning to become monochronic people having come from polychronic cultures. So Western people in low context cultures as represented by the blue clock on the left, they live by the clock. For us, time is a commodity. It is something that is worth money or at least energy. Our students are all trying to learn that we are making time for tutoring, for volunteering. In polychronic cultures, such as the high context cultural representation on the right with the red, time is fluid. There's always time for everything. In the red here, if you say to arrive at noon, you may be an hour early or two hours late. It is simply a different understanding of the relationship one has with time. Here, we can look at some of the main cultural differences to be found when examining low context and high context cultures. Take a moment to review this list, noting some of these key areas, including identity, social structure, and space. How might this idea of low context and high context cultures manifest in the learning environment? One important distinction is the role of the teacher.
In low context cultures, the teacher is among equals and can be questioned. In fact, low context cultures encourage questioning because they believe it is a sign of engagement and thinking. In high context cultures, the teacher is the authority figure not to be questioned. Take a moment to review some of the other main differences in how high and low context cultures and communication styles might show up in a learning environment. How As a tutor, you will most likely be helping a student who comes from a culture or a communication style that is different from your own. So, what do these differences mean for tutoring? Be aware that things like communication, timeliness, and personal interaction may be impacted. Some things might feel awkward or different than it would if you were interacting with someone from the United States. Be prepared for lots of opportunities to have valuable discussions and comparisons. Invite the student to notice what's different about the US, what's expected, what many people do, and how that differs from the student's own culture their own experience in workplaces, schools, etc. Help set students up for success by making these conversations explicit and helpful. American culture is not the only culture. It is also not the most correct culture. But what's helpful for the student is that as part of an American culture, as a new Mainer or a new American, they would need to know what kinds of expectations and behaviors are the cultural norm in their new home. Some other advice, pay attention to nonverbals, things like eye contact, which in America is a sign of respect, acknowledgement, connection, but from other cultures might have some connotations of challenging authority. Encourage your student to try to learn some new cultural um, practices or norms. Similarly, the teacher as the authority figure or the status um, holder in the tutoring space might not make the student feel comfortable doing things like asking questions or clarification or telling you that they don't understand. You can encourage your student to do these things as part of a normal, healthy relationship with a tutor in this context. Keep in mind also that your conversation with your student may at times be more intended for relationship building than simply task oriented. It helps you understand who they are and where they want to go. Part two of this presentation will introduce the concepts of different learning styles and multiple intelligences valuable tools for any tutor or teacher to bring into a lesson to try to find the most successful ways of helping a student learn a new language.